And this is Peter Manfredo Sr. He is a former professional boxer, world kickboxing champion, and also holds a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. So Mr. Manfredo, thanks so much for coming on the program. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. All right, so first let's talk about what got you into boxing. Um, I got into boxing because I was with, uh, I was in martial arts and then one day uh, a professional boxer came in and he's looking for some spot and I sparred with him and he said to me, oh, it's pretty nice. He says, you can do it pretty good. He says, why don't you come down to the Providence Boxing Academy because I'll meet you down there tonight. He says, it'll help out your martial arts, it'll help out your sparring. So I ended up going down there and I was there, I got hooked on it. Would you feel like, you know, with MMA kind of including in it similar to some of those um, sports that you participated in, that you would be uh, a good at uh, MMA if you were in your peak years? Yeah, if I was younger, I, I would love it. I would love to get in there and try, uh, you know, to avoid. I see a lot of openings, you know, and I, you know, I think I can get to them. Now I couldn't get to them, but, you know, in my better years, I could probably do pretty good in the sport, you know. I can't say, you know, I beat everybody, but I can, you know, I can probably hold my own. Right. So let's speak about the gym because that's what some of this interview will be about. Uh, now, you opened up a gym uh, pretty recently uh, and, and you train a lot of different people in there. So could you talk about that? I know you do uh, private lessons for kids, also do uh, some therapy sessions with Parkinson patients. So can you go through all that, please? Um, I opened up this gym with the intent of not really training many more fighters because it's a lot of time it takes away from your personal life. I mean, I put a lot of years into it and I've done pretty well with it. But uh, this gym I opened up, I was just concentrating on um, doing like classes for uh, young kids and adults, you no know, fitness classes, but you know, they would learn the, uh, the fundamentals the proper way that I taught it over the past 45 years and uh, you know it, it was pretty successful you know, you know it was I was doing well with it and then I started doing some of the rock steady the pockets and the boxing classes and uh, you know I didn't really want to get into it some uh, a friend of mine got me into it and uh, you know and I, I fell in love with it because I was helping a lot of people that were suffering from Parkinson's disease and uh, you know, I'm doing well with the classes, but I still got a couple of fighters I'm working with now, uh, Topa Khan Cleary and Shelly Vincent, and I'm starting to play around with some new amateurs. So, you know, just keeping it on the side so, I, so I don't uh, lose my touch. So let's go a little bit more in depth about that. So with the Parkinson's patients, obviously that's a horrible disease and we know what it's done. We see what happened to Muhammad Ali as one of the most famous people with Parkinson's disease. How do you teach a lot of these people that are in the class boxing or is it more, and I know we talked about this a little bit when we were talking earlier about, you said you do a lot of stretching. So how does that work? Well, they come in and they're, they're stiff. You know, their their range of motion is, is gone. There's a lot of things that they've done in Prior in the you know prior in their lives that they can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. So you know I'll stretch them as best as I can. You know I, I you know it's group sets it's it's a group session. So you know I I work on you know extending the arms forward, big movement, on extending the arms backwards. Try to make uh, let them do movements that they would do during a regular day. You know in the house. You know they I strengthen their legs. I work on their balance. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let them stretch out. You know, sometimes their balance is, has problems. So I make, you know, keep their legs above shoulders with the pot and see if they can touch their toes and then come back. You know, eventually I'm looking to gain a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more strength in the muscle. You know, the more that the they come, the, the, uh, the better that they get. So the more flexibility, the more main range of motion. And I also work on, the, like I said, balance, strength, flexibility. Uh, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, they'll hit the bags and I'll whip their wind. And while they're hitting the bags, I'll call different combinations up. Uh, you know, and I'll make them count to do their voice. You know, they get the voice uh, therapy also because a lot of them, this speech goes. So I make them yell. You know, I'll, like I'll do one, one of my drills is that I'll count from two, they'll throw two punches at a time from two to four to six, to eight, all the way to 20. 
and they count as loud as they can. As I call the combination, I'll say two. And for example, they'll throw one, two, and they'll yell how loud one, two. I'll go all the way up to 20 with a throw 20 punches. Give them a little break, and then I count back to, to two. So those are, you know, some of the uh, exercises I do. Or sometimes I'll make them sit in a chair. They'll partner off, and they'll stand, which will strengthen their legs, throw a couple of punches, and sit. Do 30-second, you know, intervals like that. And each one of them go, I'll do like three-minute rounds, two-minute rounds. And they get tired pretty quick. And I'll do a lot of, uh, you know, like when you get, if you're, uh, uh, what do they call that, when when the, the police stop you and they think that you're, uh, you know, you've had something to drink, so they put you through that test where you're going to walk the line. I make them walk the line so for their balance, heel to toe. And I'll stand there. Some of the people I have are in their 80s, their 70s, so I'll hold, they'll hold on to me. I'll hold on to them, and I make them walk. I even have people in walkers who they can't walk upstairs. I'll have these stairs set up where they'll walk up the stairs, walk down the stairs, you know, all different things that like that. But it's you know it's very gratifying to me and satisfying to me to see that they're improving their lives and they're improving because they come in and they tell me and they, you know and they're they're older they're elderly they you know I have some in their 60s some in their 70s some in their 80s and they come in we have a lot of fun. We joke, you know, we, you know, and they, they, I see, I see advancement. I see progression and so do they. And that's why they keep coming back. So you have a pretty religious group, you would say that comes consistently then. Right now I have 11 of them. You know, like I said, I, I, I just want to, the most I'll go in a class will be 15 because I mean, there's people that have 60, 70 in their class. There's one kid around here that started it. And he's, you know, he's got a lot of people, but you can't get to them individually. You can't really see them. I, I have more of a relationship with them by me, you know, just keeping the, the group small. So let's talk a little bit also about the children that you teach. We see a lot as, as far as in schools with the bullying aspect. As a person that's a teacher, I see that consistently. Uh, so is, are those the kids that you're mainly getting... Uh, kids that want to worry about self-defense or are they or more kids that are interested in boxing in general? Well, a little bit of both. You know, what, you know, the problem is right now, I mean, I get a lot of uh, self, a lot of people that kids that come in because, you know, they're being bothered or they, they're shy or they, you know, they, they're in middle school. They're going to be moving up to uh, high school or you know, moving up to middle school. And, you know, they just, they just, they're not violent kids and, you know, they, and they're going to get pushed around. So their parents bring them in. They get a couple of kids that want to fight, but, the thing is with the fighting is, is it's a long road. It's a long, you know, they, they think they want to fight until they start getting hit. But, you know, I've, I, you know lately, uh, before this pandemic, uh, whatever it is, started, I, they were, uh, I started them doing some sparring. The parents were into it and the kids were into it, you know. So you're going to do it correctly. You can't let them get hit to the head a lot. You know, you're going to make sure you don't let them start too young, you know, with the sparring. And you're going to work on defense. You know, I, I've come up with some solutions where I can, you know, everything is defense first and movement and, and you know, then punching off that or punching, you know, before that combination punching. And the kids seem to enjoy it. They seem, they can see the progress. Like some kids, they, they start off, they can't even do a push up. They can't even do a sit up. I mean, that's how some of these kids come in. So then some you can get, they can do a lot. But, then you, but you, you know, you used to start off even if they do one, before you know what they're doing five and they're doing 10, and they can see, the, you know, the, the progression. They can see they're, they're advancing and they, and they like it. What made you want to keep training and not just take a break from all these sports that you've been doing your whole life? Oh, I was so into it. I was so into the martial arts and I was so into the boxing that I just, I was addicted to it. I couldn't let it go. Plus, I used to run. I had... I had gyms all my life. I started off, I was really an entrepreneur. I started off at my grandfather at the sixth time in the house. He thought I was crazy as I wanted to do in his basement. I wanted to teach, you know, martial arts. So then, you know, eventually I did, he let me do it. And I started getting a lot of kids. So, and then I eventually opened up a place and then, and I've been doing that all my life. So I didn't want to get away from, you know, I was so into it and, uh, you know, it's been like a, it's been part of my life, and it still is. It's, you know, I'll probably so, die doing it. <laughs> so let's talk about this. You know, 
for somebody like me that's never stepped into the ring, if you were training me right from the start and I walked into your gym tomorrow, what would you tell me that I should know right away, right before I step in the ring? That you need to be in condition and you need to learn your fundamentals and you need to learn some defense. It takes, oh, I wouldn't put you in the ring until at least five, six months. So, so you can get the basics down. You need to learn how in you, your way around the ring. You need to learn to throw your combinations. You need to get your legs strong. Being in boxing condition and being in any other type of condition is two different things. In boxing condition is so much harder. That's why it's the number one workout in the world. It beats anything. I and mean, if you can be in real good boxing condition, throw punches on a consistent basis, be able to move, slip, step, weave, turn, position. You're to learn so much work. You know, there's so much involved. That's what people don't understand. They think, well, I'm just going to get in there, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm going to be able to slug it up with somebody because I'm tough. You need, to, you, need to be, you need to use your head in there. You need to think in there. It's not only toughness. I don't, I've had a lot of tough guys that never made it. I need smart guys that are tough, that have a lot of heart, <coughs> excuse me, and that are willing to sacrifice because there's a lot of sacrifice to become a good boxer. Right. They don't realize the hand-eye coordination. These people think it's like wrestling, WWE, but it's for sure not that. That's fake and boxing's not. Let's move on to this. We hear a lot about concussions in sports right now. Uh, football, even soccer. Uh, in boxing, you're getting consistently hit in the head. You talk about head trauma. So being hit so much in the head, Mr. Manfredo, do you worry about that as far as a boxer goes? you know, later on in life in general, or even before that? Well, you know, especially now, there's a lot of things coming out, but uh, yeah, it's, like I'm saying, you can't, it's, it's getting real tough now, but that's why they don't want to let the kids, the young kids, spar. before, uh, when I, I'm talking about when I first started, you know, there was kids that were sparring when they were five or six years old, but you can't let them take shots to the head at that age. Now they wait, they, they wait before they put them in. Uh, when my son was coming up, Jason Estrada and Matt Godfrey, when I had them three, they were at 16 years old, they were fighting men 20, in their 20s. They went to the uh, US championships. They made it by winning locally, <coughs> excuse me, my throat is dry, by winning uh, regionally. Then when they got to the, the national tournament, they had to fight men. You know, you, 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 you get in a pool in your weight class and the computer draws the class. And then you got to fight whoever comes up, you know, who your opponent is. And, uh, you know, they, they take shots. So it's dangerous. Now they got these younger kids fighting each other. I think you don't have to, if you're 16, you can't fight a guy over 18. Whereas before, if you're 16, you're in this national tournament, you're going to fight a guy 24, 25. If you've got 10 fights, you're considered, in the amateurs, you're considered an open fighter. Back then, if you had 10 fights, you could fight a guy with 200 fights because you're both open. If, you're, if you make it that far into the tournament, it's, it's not easy. So, yeah. Yeah, and then you, they also got to be watching the gym. It's, you know, a lot of people don't understand. And this is the main, you know, what, I, what I'm worried about is they, they get, they spar in the gym three, four times a week. People don't see that. They don't see that. They just see the end result. They don't know about the punches that are being taken in the gym. The sparring that they get, they're doing in the gym. And it happens on all the time. <coughs> Excuse me, my, mouth, my throat is dry. No, it's all right, Mr. Manfredo. If I get myself a drink, I'll take you up over there. Yeah. But, no. uh, go ahead. You know, boxes don't make a lot of money. You know, the promoters are taking the money, the venues, the television, the train is. And all these other people are taking a little bit of cut. So they may make, you know, maybe two or three million a fight. By the time all those other people take the money, they're down to nothing. So with that being said, can you relate to that? And, and should boxers start a union or at least get a fair wage, some retirement benefits, even a 401k? So at least when they're down the road, when they're in retirement, they have some kind of money that they can cash in on and not go broke like so many other 
you know, boxers have and also other athletes in general? Well, the problem is, first of all, there's not many people that make millions of dollars. There's just a small circle of guys. Those are the elite guys. Those are the guys who are the top of the line. And they try to stay in that circle to make that money. Many of these guys, most of the majority of these guys, the most of the pay they'll probably get will be, and that's, it's hard to 20, 30, 40,000. If they get that, they're doing decent. But the majority of them don't get that. Uh, yeah, uh, the, what are we talking about? The headshots? And what were you saying? No, we were talking about uh, like retirement benefits for oh, the, the, yeah. the union. Yeah. yeah well, the union. at one time, they were trying to start a union. They had, uh, I think Jerry Cooney was involved. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, Gary Bella. There was a few guys that were involved, but you know, it didn't go far. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to get your money. Who's going to put into that money? Who's going to put that money in? It's not like it's a, a union for a laboring crew or, you know, the laborers, you know, or, or, you know, the electricians union where they're going to put money out of their weekly salaries or their monthly salary. This, these guys, they fight for nothing. The majority of them fight for zero. A couple of thousand dollars. That's, you know, it's an eight-week training camp. The hell is that? You know, and then they got to pay their, you know, it's 10%. And usually most of their trainers take 10%. And they got to pay their manager. Some of their managers take 33%. You got to pay the cup, man. It's crazy. Now they're working on strength and condition, guys. So, you know, there's not much money out there to get, so they don't get much money. And how many fights are they signed for a year? Some guys are signed for four. Some guys are signed for five. You know, even if they get six fights a year, if they're only fighting four rounders, the, less, the least of the rounds is the least of the money you're going to get. You know, when you start getting to 10 rounds, if they make it that high, that's where the more, you know, the better money comes in, 10-round fighters. We see MMA is on the rise. As, our, as a person that's done karate and boxing in general in the mix with MMA, do you feel like it's hurting the sport of boxing? No, it's, it's, I don't think so. I never, I know, I mean, it's, 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 it's its own, it's its own style. It's its own, you know, it's the punching, the kicking, and the, uh, the grappling. But, uh, you know, I'm not into, I, I like it. I mean, I'm not, I would never insult a, uh, a mixed martial artist because I know they work hard at what they do and they're skilled in three different levels of, you know, they can fight, they can punch through some of them, they can kick and, and they can grapple. But some of it is boring to me because I don't like the ground stuff. You know, I mean, I, I'm not into the ground stuff as much as they are, especially when they're at a stalemate. If they're up in, in the uh, stand-up position where they're punching and kicking, I like that a lot. You know, it's really good. And they got those small gloves. They're, they're tough. Most martial artists and most MMA guys, are they're tough. They're bad. But, they, you know, their hands, most of their hands are, you know, they're, they're not that good, most of them. To follow up on that, do you think uh, <laughs> that a lot of these martial artists, that are mixed martial artists, they could go into the boxing ring and win fights? Or do you don't believe that? Some of them do. They use them. They use them around here. They use them, but you know they're not. They think they're not going to make much money either because they're boxing. It's a different sport. You know. You know. The, you, a lot of times they're going to rely on their feet. To, you know to keep them away. Or they're going to rely on getting in close. They're going to try to grab. You know. They, they're used to that stuff. Over in the in the boxing, you can't. Once they you know they start grabbing each other, the referee breaks. It's not part of the game. You know. They, they can't kick somebody, which you can keep them away a little bit further. So it's all hands, and I mean, they've, there's a lot of them that got in there and tried it, but very few have been successful where they're making big money out of it. This is Peter Manfredo Sr. He is a professional boxer and also a world champion kickboxer and also holds a third-degree black belt in Taekwondo. How was it to train your son? It's not easy. It wasn't easy, you know, and uh, it's a, it's... It's, it didn't turn out to be too good for him and me, but I did. But, um, you know, he's, you know, he made himself a name. He was, you know, he was a fairly decent fighter. You know, he got on that show. He made himself uh, an even bigger name. And uh, he's still looking to fight. He still fought again. He's, you know, he's, which uh, the whole family is against, you know, and until he realizes that, you know, he, you know, he, can, do, he can do better things to make himself some money. 
you know, we're, we're going to be at odds, you know. I, I, you know, I don't think he should be fighting anymore. And neither does his mother or, his, or anybody else in the family. So it's kind of like a sore subject to me right now. Uh, when did you know Peter was a great fighter? Well, I mean, you know, he had a lot of, like I said at one time, you know, you got to get, you got to get the experience. And uh, you know, he, he had a lot of amateur fights. He had about 150 amateur fights. You know, he started when he was young. And, he, you know, he was in the gym all his life because I wouldn't let him go hang around the streets. His mother was working. I had the gym. So as soon as he got him out of school, <coughs> excuse me, him and his sister right to the gym. You know, like it or not, he didn't have to box or anything, but he had to stay there, help clean up. <coughs> I was running the business. So I couldn't have him at home. I can't keep my eye on him then. And, you know, by the time his mother got to work, we were just trying to, you know, we were trying to, you know, support the family, pay for the house, you know. But, uh, you, know, you know, he started winning some, you know, some amateur tournaments, you know, locally. And, you know, he, and he was getting experience. And he decided to take it to another level and another level. And, you know, before, you know, he was a professional. We signed up, uh, you know, we got, he was 21 and 0. And then he got to, uh, the opportunity to fight on that contender series, which, you know, blew it up pretty big for him. Because television is a, you know, it's, it's a big tool. If you're seen on television and, you know, you, you, people start to like you, you can go far. And that's exactly what happened to him. And he gave it, you know, one thing about my son, he always had, you know, he's had big heart. He'd fight anybody. He never refused. He never backed down from anybody. So, you know, that's what, that's what people want to see. They want to see a fight. They don't want to see guys running around and not being able to close the show. They want guys that are going to go in there like a Vinnie Paz. I mean, I don't think Vinnie Paz was a great was the greatest fighter but he gave people what they wanted to see you know he had guts he had heart he went in there to fight you had to kill him to get him out of there and that's what people pay to see that's what the network television wants to see they pay for that right so so i want to talk about this to go into the contender uh, how did Peter get uh, shown on the contender I, I guess that was not the right word but how did he get how did they find him was that like a sign-up process, or how did that work? Uh, this is this is what happened once. I was going to the Olympic trials with mm -hmm. uh, Roland Estrada, Jason's father, mm -hmm. and Jimmy Birchfield. Uh, Jason was had it was like a box off. It was Olympic box offs. On the way back, we drove from Providence to Cleveland. On the way back, it was a Friday night. Vinny Paz called Jimmy Birchfield. And he says, oh, I was just with Frank Stallone, and they're going to come up with this television series, reality series about boxing, and I want to see if we can get Joey Spina around. I'm looking for Italian guys. So Jimmy says, well, how about Peter Manfredo Jr.? He went, oh, I didn't think about him. Yes, yeah. So Jimmy got involved with it. We were signed at the time with CES. And uh, they found out that there was a box off, but they had like a whole bunch of applicants to try out for the show it was held in Brockton. So we went. He spotted a couple of people up there, and then they what they did was they had a camera uh, uh, in a room, and they were just interviewing people. So when they interviewed them, they, they liked what they seen, and they liked what they heard. They, they liked, <coughs> it was all about personality. And they liked his personality. They seen what he could do in the ring. Uh, he was 21 and 0. You know, he was, you know, he's a, he was a good kid. He, you know, he has a, a lot of respect for everybody. And he was like, he, he, they, they caught on to him. So then they, they did it like throughout the country. I'm not sure how many spots they did, but they did it in New England and, and some couple of places in the South, California, you know, all over the country. Then eventually they, they, they had this, they had the winner of the people. They picked so many people from every area. And then they went to California. And they had the, the, the gentleman, I forget his name was, that ran it. He was from out of England. And they went out there and they kept picking my son. They, then they only had 100 people. Out of thousands, they had 100. Out of 100, they had, they had like the last 25, 30. And they picked them. They liked them and then they, picked, they put them in there. And that's what, that's what happened. And that's how we got on. Well, let's talk about the series. He did extremely well on the series. Went to the finals and the Staples Center, and I assume that you were there for the sure. was in Las Vegas. Oh, Las Staples Vegas. Center. Yeah, the Staples Center was almost, yeah, I was there. Uh, right. I mean, I, 
At first, I couldn't go. They didn't mm -hmm. want any parents or anybody. He had his wife there. They put his wife in a house. And I was, I was talk, I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't even talk to him. I would wow. call his wife. Have you seen him? No, I haven't seen him in a couple of days because they had, they were shooting the show. It was like they had like, uh, you couldn't say anything. It was, everything was, in, they couldn't disclose anything that was going on in the show. You had to sign a contract. So then one day I happened to, uh, I was going for a walk and he called me. And he was, he was, uh, he was like, not in a good mood. He said he had lost. I said, lost? I said, to who? He says, ah, this kid, they put me through a, they had to do this challenge and I wasn't ready. I wasn't on, I had so much weight in the day. I had no energy and this and that. I want to come home. I want to, because they wouldn't put him home. They separated him from all the, I said, listen, they're going to call you back. No, they're not. They're not. I said, yeah. They, I said, they like you. I said, something happens, you're going to be there. Sure enough, a kid gets sick. A kid from Massachusetts got sick, and they called him back. They voted him back on. Oh, wow. He goes, I'm not going to be ready. I said, just stay working on. You'll be ready. You'll be ready. You'll be ready. So then he called me. He says, I'm going to be fighting tonight. He goes, I'm going to be fighting the kid, Miguel Espino. And we knew him from the images. I knew he was a tough kid. He said, he's going to just going to work. So I wasn't there still. And he, I waited up. It was like 4.30 in the morning. He called me because I beat him. Said, yeah. Then he goes, I think they're going to have you come out here. Said, boom, I jumped on a plane. I shot out there. And then I stayed out there for like the last three or four weeks. You know, then I stepped, I stayed. Did I they pay for you to go out there, Mr. Manfredo, or no? Yeah, they did. Okay. They, did. they paid my way and then they paid me. But I had, a, you know, I had, a, I had to buy my own food and stuff. But yeah, yeah. No, that was all right. And I, like I said, I stayed with my daughter-in-law and I stayed with my granddaughter. So until the show was over. So... So could you talk about Las Vegas? So in that final fight against Mora, it was a close fight. And it seemed like Peter won. If you watch the fight, I actually just watched the fight on YouTube uh, about a couple hours back before we talked the first time. And it looked like he won. And the referees went to a split decision, gave it a Mora. What was your opinion on the fight? Well, the one in Vegas was close, but I thought Mora pulled that one out. But the one in the Staples Center, I thought, I thought we pulled it out. I mean, you know, you can't, you're fighting him in his hometown. He's yeah. from L.A. And uh, we fought at the state, but, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you got to go out there and you got to you got to knock him out to, to win, you know. But, you know, if, it, if you're going to make it close, you're just not going to get the, the draw. Yeah, it was a split, but, you know, he still did well. He made well. He made good money out of it. And it, and it got him, it got him to, a, like, like him and Mora, uh, their, their minimums were $100,000 a fight after that. And the two guys, Jesse Brinkley and Gomez, they were the semifinalists. Their minimums were like seventy-five thousand per fight. So you don't get that's unheard of. So these guys, they fight around here. They fight for hardly anything. You know, a couple of thousand, twenty-five hundred. It's nothing. These guys were into big money, you know, and they were televised, so it was big. So the world boxing news just came out with Morris saying that he wants to fight. Uh, Peter Manfredo Jr. again. Do you believe that will happen? I hope not. Yeah. I, I don't even, I won't even, I, I, I don't know if it will happen, but I don't want to, I, I mean, like I just got through saying, I don't want to see him fight anymore. Right. You know, it comes a time where you got to quit. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a young man's game. Yeah. Now, he hurt. did just beat that guy in uh, Twin Rivers a couple months back. Yeah, but those um, guys aren't more. Uh, yeah, that's true. Fought, they, you know, they're different level. I mean, he's coming back off of a long layoff. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's not going to listen to me anyway. So, I mean, if if the fight does happen, you know, good luck to him. I, there's nothing I can do. I was not, I'm not going to – if I was to say anything, i tell him not to fight anymore. But, he, like I said, he's not going to listen. He's his own man. He make, Excuse me. He makes his own decisions. And that's how well, it goes. This is Peter Manfredo Sr. He was a professional boxer, world kick kickboxing champion, also had a third-degree black belt in Taekwondo. Mr. Manfredo, uh, do you believe boxing will ever be as popular again where, where it was with Ali, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, all those different decades where it was huge? Well, I'm sure if someone exciting comes along as in the heavyweight division, because that's what they want to see, you know, the heavyweights make the money. Yeah, and those, you know, and they're, they're – um, they're showing some skill. Those guys fought everybody, though. 
Muhammad Ali fought everybody, you know? <laughs> people, you had a lot of people that wanted to see him win. You had just as many people that wanted to see him get beat. You know, and he knew just how to handle it. And, you know, there was great, there was a lot of great heavyweights at the time. I'm sure it can, I don't know if it'll ever happen again, but if you get a few guys that, that are in shape and that, you know, like I said, it's a tough sport. It's, it's, it's a yeah. tough way to make a living. Right. What do you feel like is the future for Rhode Island boxing? There's not, I don't know, there's, there's, you know, there's local fighters, there's local pugs, but there's only, you know, there's the kid, Demetrius Bubu Andre, you know, he, he's, he's got a lot of skill and he's, you know, he's making good money. He, he was an Olympian, you know, he's, uh, he's the real deal. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, he's got he's to fight somebody that's, uh, you know, in the top, you know, top tier of people. But, and then the kid Toka Khan, that I, that I have, he's another one that's, that could possibly make it. So we got to see, you know what I mean? I mean, once they get to the big show, the big lights, they got to perform. Uh, what life lessons do you feel like bo boxing's taught you throughout your life? Well, one thing I, I know is I guess it gives you a lot of respect for people. And let's, because most of these guys and most of these kids come from nothing. And, you know, no matter what it is, where you go, I see a lot of good kids, and they look like they're you know they're tough. They can tough. They can handle themselves in the ring, but they have a, a lot of respect you know, for each other, you know. And they, they try to stay out of trouble. They try to do the right thing. It's it's you know, and I, and I love I like that about it. Where can people find more about you in the gym? They Did just call it? my gym. I'll come down, and I'm on 55 Douglas Pike. Um, I usually get a website there, but I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, you know, I'm easily, I can easily be, you know, uh, contacted on that. So, you know, but uh, I just opened up a nice new place. I'm in, I'm in Smithfield. So I get, I, I get out of the city, Providence. I was in uh, Pawtucket for Providence and Cranston for a while. But I moved into North Smithfield, so I'm getting a different type of clientele, which is nice. Like I said, and, uh, you know, we got a, a few fighters that we work and you know, it's a real clean gym and it's, you know, it's a, it's a state of the art. We have a lot of weights. We have a lot of bags. We have a nice ring. And we got the we got the intelligence, the the, uh, the knowledge on the game. Right. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Manfredo. This was Peter Manfredo Sr. As I said, he was a former boxer, world kickboxing champion, also a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. Thanks so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, my man. Have a good one. Have a nice Easter. Stay All safe. Right,